Um, I also work on uh, Pizza Dow. Um, during the pandemic, we threw the world's largest pizza party. Spent about $300,000 uh, feeding people around the world on May 22nd for Bitcoin Pizza Day. Uh, and then I also work on uh, the Notorious Frogs, which is a, uh, a blockchain-based uh, fantasy RPG game, 1930s gangster frogs. In a fantasy world, we got aliens, we got wizards, and we got amphibians. It's fun. All right, so what is Election Guard? Election Guard is an open source software development kit that makes voting more secure, transparent, and accessible, right? Um, this is uh, a project that was started by uh, a, a man named uh, Josh Benelow at Microsoft probably 12, uh, 12 years ago, something like that. And um, in the past like four, five, six years, there's been a lot of traction around this topic and it's led to um, a, you know, a lot of extra development. So everything that we have is MIT licensed. Uh, we're developing an encryption library that is complete, that's based on C++. Uh, we've got a WASA module that's in the works. Uh, we've got a Python reference implementation. And then the community has built uh, a few other implementations, one in Kotlin. Uh, there's a TypeScript implementation that exists now as well. And uh, yeah, most of it's built around a .NET stack because of you know, Microsoft. And so who's building this? Uh, you know, Microsoft's Democracy Forward program. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're a small startup. Uh, I've got a link here for or the, the PhD thesis that started all of this thing, if you guys are um, interested in reading any of that. But we're gonna walk through the protocol here in a few minutes. Uh, and then Inferno Red is uh, the software development partner. And then we have a few different partners for voting systems manufacturers. Um, Hart InterCivic uh, is based in Texas and they've got uh, voting machines that they um, sell into communities here in the US. Uh, Enhanced Voting is uh, focused on building online experiences that are uh, accessible for people. And then uh, we've got Voting Works as well, uh, who's building machines that are uh, using consumer off-the-shelf hardware, right, to keep uh, to make it so that you don't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on all these different machines. Uh, MITRE is building a, a, a verifier, and we'll talk about verifiers in a little bit. Uh, and then you know we've got a Center for Civic Design partners at universities, uh, you know, kind of all over the country who have contributed in some way to to this thing. Okay, so how does it work? Election Book Guard is uh, basically divided into three steps. There's the election setup, which is a trusted setup process. There's uh, the actual encryption of the votes. Uh, and then there's the tallying and decryption phase. So in this first phase, um, this might look familiar to some people, uh, we use uh, Shamir's secret sharing mechanism here in order to pass information around. Uh, the encryption methodology that we're using is Algamal. So um, you know, each uh, uh, we call these guys guardians, right? They're just public-private key pairs, and they um, you know, share parts of their private key material around so that we can do uh, quorum-based decryption, so that, that way no, uh, no individual is able to in uh, decrypt any other individual's specific ballot, right? So the ballot encryption phase, uh, and this is what the C++ library is built on, and it's designed specifically to run on low-powered hardware like scanners, um, you know, and other machines like that. Uh, like I said, we're using Algamal to encrypt each one of these ballots, and then we have uh, a uh, Chom-Peterson proof that proves uh, that the encrypted value is either a zero or one, a true or false, yes, you voted yes, or no, you voted no. Um, then for each contest in a, uh, on a ballot, say like school board, for example, choose three out of five, we have a, uh, a range proof that is responsible for making sure that the, the sum of all of those values from each of the selections does not exceed the uh, maximum, right? So all of this happens very quickly. Um, we never write out the, um, uh, the plain text ballots out to disk. Uh, we work entirely in an encrypted space because we have these homomorphic properties of Alchemal. Uh, so once the machine has encrypted that value from that point on, if uh, anything else in the system ever released, it's all gonna become public anyway at the end of the election. All right, so this is um, where things start to get a little bit interesting. So what we end up doing is we create a confirmation code for voters, right? So once we do the encryption, uh, there's a basically a hash value that includes uh, the entire ballot, uh, a representation of the schema of the ballot, uh, and some other information uh, like you know device ID, things like that, that are uh, rolled up into this uh, tracking code, verification code, confirmation code, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and at the end of the election, when the tally is completed and the decrypted value of the tally is published, the, uh, a voter can go to a website and they can go and they can check and verify that their vote was actually included in the election record. Right, so what's really important here though is that 
uh, this confirmation code gets generated at the point of encryption um, prior to the decision of the voter to cast or spoil. Um, and that, uh, and you know, spoiling a ballot is, uh, we're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, but that separation between the encryption happening and then the decision to um, what you're going to do with that as a voter is what makes this whole system work. And it creates this challenge mechanism that um, allows voters to be able to challenge the system and make sure that it's behaving correctly. So that's where the, the challenge ballots come in, also known as uh, spoiled ballots. And uh, what we do here is, uh, um, in most jurisdictions, where whenever you go vote, if you make a mistake on a ballot, uh, you typically can take that back up to the table, say, hey, I made a mistake, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna use this one, and then they'll give you a brand new ballot, and then you can go and you can cast that. So um, we actually piggyback on that process, which is a legal process. Um, and those spoiled ballots actually become part of the election record. And so what we do is uh, we actually do decrypt the spoiled ballots, the ballots that are not cast and are not included in the election. And uh, what this means is you as a voter can go in and you know, say fill in all the first selection, get your confirmation code, say spoil it, challenge it, go back up to the table depending on what sort of process or system is being used. Uh, and then you go back through and you vote for real, and then now you have two tracking codes. And uh, when the election results are published, since we published both the plain text and the cipher text values for the spoiled ballots, uh, you can prove that the encryption was done correctly because if the machine had misbehaved and tried to switch one of your votes, you would be able to know. And since the decision to, or the, the decision of the voter to do that is separated from the actual encryption process, um, the machine has no way to know which choice you're going to make, and so it has to behave correctly. So this right here is um, an example of, of one system. Uh, yeah, this is a, you know, an online tablet-based system. Um, this whole system is, is built to be very uh, generic and generalized and be a general voting protocol that can be used for, um, you know, for a wide variety of different use cases. And uh, we've been targeting primarily using um, uh, precinct scan cases, so like when you, you have a bubble sheet and you fill that in and there's a paper record, you scan that into a machine or tablet base, and uh, most of the, the actual accumulation of the tally and the creation of the tally, which we're gonna get into here next, is done at that precinct level. It's run by actual election officials, uh, and it's not actually run by us at all. So the tally and the decryption process is uh, homomorphic, right? So what we end up doing is we uh, we accumulate all of the cast ballots, all the selections on each one of the ballots together, and then when the decryption happens, uh, we're only decrypting that accumulated value. So we never actually decrypt an individual cast ballot. So in this way, with all of the proofs that we have in place, the Sean Peterson proofs, and uh, these homomorphic properties of, uh, of Elgamal, we don't we, we were able to protect voters' privacy because we're never actually going to decrypt one of the ballots themselves. So, and if you remember, we, we do decrypt the spoiled ballots, right? So that part um, is done, and that's, that's managed by the software. Uh, and going back to the, the key ceremony or the trusted setup process that we have, uh, in the social layer is where you enforce this. I mean, obviously, a lot of the people who are, are, are fill, fulfilling this role of guardians, typically they're election officials, they're non-technical, but that whole process uh, protects against any sort of collusion. So if somebody did want to try to decrypt uh, an individual ballot, um, they would all have to agree to it. And depending on where you are, what jurisdiction, um, what type of voting is actually happening, that may or may not be a concern, but it's, uh, it's managed in the social layer and not actually in the protocol. All right, so what about blockchain? For our use cases, um, it's not really necessary. Um, we're, we're working primarily with uh, local governments and jurisdictions where you have a lot of um, difficulty getting funding for IT systems and things like that, so um, we're not really using it, but it's, uh, the protocol is data layer agnostic. The, like I said, the most important part of this is that you separate the decision to cast or spoil and, or the challenge process from the actual encryption, so you can use this in a blockchain system. Um, we are aware of a couple of teams that are using blockchain for, for this type of stuff, uh, but for our target audience, which is you know county clerks, here in the United States who are responsible for actually implementing elections. Um, they just, they don't need it, they don't understand. Um, the, uh, there's no real value of having a decentralized distributed database come into play. And of course, like, if you've got a, a public blockchain network, 
ordering your votes in some cases can, of course, be a privacy risk. Uh, you know, if I know exactly when a vote was submitted and I can read that and I see you, say, on the news as like a newscaster is there, I can tell which of those votes were yours, even though it's encrypted. There are some certain things that um, can happen around that. So, um, of course, there's technical solutions to these things and there's ways around that. Um, so, if you guys uh, end up working with this and you find a good use case for it with blockchain, you build something, we would love to hear about it. Okay, so I promised uh, in the initial, um, in, in the brief here that I would talk a little bit about some of the lessons that we've learned uh, about how to talk about HE and zero knowledge proofs and these things with voters in actual elections. So um, probably most of this probably is not going to come as a surprise to anyone, but um, building confidence, using simple terms, uh, you know, you don't want to insult people's intelligence, but they're just, they're not going to understand the math, they're not going to understand the jargon, the terminology. Um, those things, simple things. So, like focusing on things that are similar to the way that they're they're doing it now. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that we've targeted precinct scan as a use case. It's like, well, you're using the same machines that you're using before. It's just better now. So there's no difference. Um, in a couple of cases, in the real world use cases, we've actually given people the opportunity to opt out and had machines where that are not using the encryption, and machines that are using the encryption. And in those cases, the uh, the paper ballot ends up being the system of record. And um, you would be surprised, a lot of people really want to try it out. They want to see it work. Um, there's been a lot of good feedback around it. Um, if you have to say homomorphic encryption, you have already lost. <laughs> uh, they, like, people's eyes are just going to glaze over. They're not going to understand it. They're going to get confused. And then when people start to get confused, um, they're going to say no. So um, good, great UX here is the big difference. That's really, that's really what, uh, you know, tends to give people confidence and uh, making things easy for them, uh, give them a, a simple path forward, like when you go and you check your ballot uh, at the very end of the election um, and verify it, you say my vote was counted, but then you can have like a little um, you know, sub thing where you can go and actually check the proofs and check the math, uh, if for people who are interested in doing that or people who want to, right? And so part of our model here too has been to get a number of different uh, third party vendors to create verifiers for these systems um, so that that way when the election records are published, they can run the entire data set through those and get sign off from say like the AP or, or you know, any other organization in order to build trust in, uh, in the data set. All right, so we got a few real world examples. Um, this was used in a primary in Fulton, Wisconsin in the spring of 2020. Um, absolutely crazy to be doing that right before the pandemic happened and, uh, you know, at a time in, in this country when everyone was talking about voting, it was very, very interesting. Uh, there was probably about four or 500 ballots that ran, ran through that process. Um, you know, it was, it was very, very interesting to see the way that people responded. Uh, the U.S. Uh, House Democratic Caucus used a version of this technology to do remote voting to elect their leadership uh, in the fall of 2020. Um, there was a general election in Preston, Idaho in the fall of 2022, and then in the, over the course of the next couple of years, we're still trying to work, find um, you know, more opportunities to, to work this in, uh, you know, other voting system manufacturers. For better or worse, the, the, the way that we've set up this consortium of people is that, you know, uh, Microsoft and Inferno Red are primarily leading the software development and the integration, but really driving this from partners, you know, for-profit companies who are selling machines uh, you know, watchdog organizations who want to be the ones who do the verification or build the, the voting websites for people um, and that sort of thing. So it really, um, it, it's a bit of a tribe. I think it's probably a good way to put it. And, uh, you know, we're always on the lookout for new opportunities to, to, um, to get this thing out there and get people using it. All right, so um, if you're interested in helping uh, us, you know, you can join the discussion. We run everything open, open source. We work in public. Uh, we just open sourced uh, the latest version of our encryption library a couple of days ago. Uh, you know, our, our, our backlog is, is open. We run everything on GitHub discussions. There's monthly community calls. Um, you know, so yeah, come and check it out, hang out, see what's going on. Uh, also, you know, if you're interested in this sort of thing, anytime that you're talking to people and this type of thing comes up, you know, we have a solution in place that works for how to, um, to attest and assert that the voting machines are behaving correctly. So um, just getting people in your local community, um, you know, if you sit on, a, say, like school board or anything like that, um, just kind of talking about it can be really, really helpful. And then, of course, uh, the discovery of new use cases, right? We are focused very much on real world, in-person, secret ballot elections. Um, but this protocol can be used uh, as a, you know, a blinding factor for any sort of voting that requires secret ballot. So um, we're very interested to see any new ways that people want to use the software. 
And of course, you can build something cool, right? If you're a software engineer, uh, the third-party verifiers, any language you want, the, the specification is open source as well. There are uh, examples in Python, Rust, C Sharp, C++, uh, TypeScript, I think. Uh, we already have a whole bunch of them, but the more we can get, the better, because that, you know, there could be a bug in one, you know, you never know. Um, but helping build out the verifier websites is something else that would be really useful in general because that also helps convey the information that comes out of those verifiers. Uh, and then uh, also reviewing the specification. Um, just uh, a month ago, we had somebody um, get up on GitHub and was looking at the spec and found a more efficient way for us to do the key ceremony and the decryption that ended up saving probably about 30% of the compute cycles um, which is really cool to see happen, you know, especially in a room with a, a whole bunch of academics who've been working on this thing, and then like all of a sudden somebody comes in and finds something really cool and new, and like we responded to that, and within two weeks they had changed the specification, and uh, we had started building that new thing. Um, we've got some cool stuff um, on the roadmap, like risk limiting audits uh, and rank choice voting and other methods of voting. Some of this stuff um, really requires us to do cool stuff like uh, build a proxy re-encryption mix net and things like that. And um, these are all really kind of interesting, like academically difficult, for me at least, <laughs> um, uh, software engineering problems that we can, we're can. we always looking for people to contribute to, new ways to uh, help with that stuff. And then of course, uh, Microsoft has a bug bounty. Uh, you know, anything simple, you can just throw it up on our GitHub. Uh, anything that is security related, there's a, a process for that that's in the, in the GitHub. And, uh, you know, I've, I've seen them pay it out before. So, um, yeah, there's some cash. Yep, I think that's it. I know I blew through a lot of stuff. I've got about three minutes left. If anybody has any questions, do we have time for questions? Can you, can you go over the section where it was the spoil versus cast vote? Because you were saying the system itself wouldn't be able to know what the user is doing. Is that like, like assuming the system was affected by malware? Or is this something, like, mm -hmm. I, can we go over that area a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So um, the question is, how does the, uh, the, the process around the casting and the spoiling and the encryption work, particularly if they're on the same machine, right? So the... Um, once you encrypt the ballot, depending on what type of system it is, that encryption might print out a, the confirmation code, it might display it as a QR on a screen, uh, or uh, you know, some other way. But once that confirmation code is created, the, um, that specific machine, even if it's on the same computer, it doesn't know what you're going to do, um, whether you're going to cast or spoil the ballot itself. So um, once the encryption is created, there's no way for them to change it. So even if there were malware that were running on it, and as long as a few people actually go and check the spoiled ballots and improve, then you can, you can rely on you know, statistics and heuristics to um, validate that the machines are behaving correctly. Um, the other thing that's probably important to note here too is that if any of these proofs don't check, the system is designed to halt. And um, we made that decision um, kind of early on, mostly because of the fact that the people who are going to be working with these things, these machines, are non-technical. So if there's a, a major problem with the math, we want the machine to just stop, and they turn it off, and they take it out of service, and then they go get a backup, and they put that, that one in, and then we can take it offline and see what happens. Does that, does that answer your question? Cool. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, really I really appreciate this, yeah. and it's fascinating. Like, uh, yeah, thank you. This is, uh, it's really going to help build the future and keep it safe. Uh, so we're just going to do a couple minutes of setup, and in just about two or three minutes, we're going to uh, talk about uh, using this uh, with the Brazilian government for a hackathon.